You did well today, Mr. Bennett. Simply keep the ice pack on your knee for 30 minutes or more if necessary. You've already taken ibuprofen and acetaminophen, so no more for three hours. Yes, I remember. When do you come? Well, today is Monday. Tomorrow you will do the exercises, and I will come on Wednesday. Remember we open to an earlier schedule on Wednesday. No more of those late morning workouts. I'll be here at 9, and then you have a free day. Sounds good. Drive with caution, Maggie. I'm not going anywhere. The last phrase made her chuckle. I couldn't go anywhere yet. She's nice enough when she's done, but she's a damn sadist when she's working on me. Ten days ago, I had knee replacement surgery on my right knee. I've heard stories about post-op physical therapy, and there's nothing good about them other than it won't last forever. I thought that I could survive almost anything if I knew that the end was not far off, but probably everyone I know has a higher pain threshold than me. It was torture. The whole idea of physical therapy after knee replacement is to achieve at least 90 degrees of knee flexion. Sounds simple, right? The surgeon cuts the tissue, and then the tissue is restored, connected by fibers and fused together. The problem is that the severed segments tend to attach to whatever is nearby, and physical therapy is designed to break down all of these unwanted attachments until the knee begins to function properly and bend as expected again. Think about this while you pour me a beer. The therapist got into her car and drove away. In case anyone's wondering, her name is Maggie. Actually, she is a good child, but she has no pity. She has heard these screams before and knows that pain is the path to recovery. When I'm feeling generous, I call her baby. I think she's about 20 and I'm 57. So to me, she's a child. Not that it matters, but my name is Henry Bennett, and I make custom kitchen cabinets in a small four-person workshop that I own. And yes, one of these people is a woman, and she's a damn good carpenter and cabinet maker. But I'm old school, and saying shop for four people just doesn't sound right. I'm thinking about expanding the business and making furniture, mainly Windsor chairs, so I'm not thinking about retiring. I seem to be standing up and down, squatting, standing and then kneeling on this hard floor all day long, so somehow the cartilage in my knee wore out and I got some factory replacement parts. So I'm sitting here at my window with my leg up, ice on my knee, watching Maggie drive away, when I notice Jenny Carpenter pulling into her garage across the street. The Carpenters are about 20 years old. Chris is also a carpenter by trade, which makes his last name even more ironic and he is working hard to start his own small company of carpentry contractors. They do good work and are in demand by homeowners who need repairs and remodels, as well as mid-sized companies that often need additional specialists. I know he has dreams of expanding his company to become a major new home contractor, and we talked at length about how to grow a young company. This is something I know a little about. Seizing the opportunity Jenny is an attractive blonde who works for one of the big investment houses in the city. I liked her. I thought to myself, they really are the perfect couple. When he saw a black BMW approaching her driveway, you don't often see cars like this in this area, and you don't often see a guy in an expensive suit walk through your neighbor's front door like he owns the house. But that's what I saw that day. I watched Jenny's house while I held the ice on my knee. After half an hour of icing my knee, I go to the kitchen to get a sandwich. I know it sounds crazy, but I can't carry a plate and a drink at the same time while using that damn walker to get back to the living room. So I pack the sandwich in a paper bag and pour a drink into a cup, put both in the stupid basket on the front of the walker, and head back to my chair. I sit down in my seat, and the BMW is still there. I also have some ice so I put the ice pack back on my knee while I sit and look at the neighbor's house across the street. Time is running out. A long hour passes before the suit finally leaves. Ten minutes later, the garage door opens and Jenny leaves too. Cold, I tell myself. There are a thousand completely worthy excuses for what I just saw. Jenny is not one of those. I'm trying to put it out of my head, but I'm bored as hell sitting here. Damn it, I need a book or a crossword puzzle or something to keep my mind occupied. The workshop called twice with fairly simple questions. I suspect that they just kept in touch, but I didn't feel abandoned. 
With nothing better to do, I decided to look through some chair design books and started brainstorming ideas for a line of simple, stylish chairs that we could make in the workshop. Late that evening, I was still sitting there, alternating between lifting my leg and doing flexion exercises and going for an ice pack while I worked on books on chair design. While reading, I drew some design ideas. I tried to develop something traditional, but convenient. It was already dark when I happened to look up and saw Chris's SUV pulling into their garage. Jenny's car was already parked in its usual place. That's when my thoughts went back to the black BMW and the driver in a fancy suit who seemed to act like he lived here. I started collecting my sketches and notes when I saw Chris crossing the street. He was heading towards my house. I walked slowly to the door and opened it just as he appeared. I stepped back to let him into the house, which turned out to be more difficult than one might think with those damn walkers. Chris, what brings you here? Well, Jenny thought that since you're recovering and can't spend much time on your feet, you might like a home-cooked meal. So she packed dinner for you and sent me across the street to deliver it. I laughed. I like your girl. As we slowly walked back to the kitchen, I asked, And what has your beautiful wife prepared for this tired old man? First of all, you are not old. But tired? I was still laughing, but Chris was indeed the first visitor I'd had all day, other than Nurse Payne, and I was enjoying his company. He placed the food on the table and began to unpack it. There was a big bowl of corn chowder, some ham biscuits, and a nice salad. My God, there's enough here for both of us. Oh no, no way. If I eat even a piece, my wife will find out and I will have a lot of problems. It's all for you. I admit that I was smiling now. I think there's enough here for dinner and tomorrow's lunch. Please tell your beautiful wife thank you for me. Now, may I offer you a beer before you make that long, arduous trek home? Chris smiled. He knew my gratitude was sincere. No, she will wait for me. I'd better go. I'll try to come by tomorrow evening. I will be here. I have nowhere to go for the next few weeks. Just as quickly, I walked Chris to the door, shook his hand, and he left. As I watched my friend walk towards his house, I thought about the value of good friends and caring wives. I'm sure I'm wrong about her, I thought. She's not like that. That evening, I enjoyed dinner. I also felt like I was getting somewhere with my drawings and notes, so I spent the evening watching TV and reading and also consumed another bag of ice. Then, after taking more ibuprofen and acetaminophen, I went to bed. Tuesday passed largely without incident. I made a simple breakfast of yogurt and granola with a glass of orange juice, took some ibuprofen and acetaminophen, and then took the coffee to the chair in the living room. I sipped my coffee for about 20 minutes, letting the pills take effect and then began the unpleasant task of exercising my new store-bought knee. No pain, no gain. My exercises start with a series of simple movements, such as leg lifts and ankle kicks. I then begin to bend my knee while lying down, and when I'm ready, I use a band to pull my ankle toward me, forcing the knee to bend. I do the reps, and by the time I'm breathing like a long-distance runner, I'm ready to stop and ice my knee. The work is not hard but it takes a lot of discipline to pull that tape, knowing that it will hurt like a son of a bitch. For the next half hour, I settle for supporting my foot and applying ice. By mid-morning, I'm ready to continue my day and get back to working on the drawings I started yesterday. Sitting by the window, I work and watch the world. Neighbors come and go from their homes. Dan Williams mows his lawn. He retired and turned lawn and yard care into an obsession. I guess that's what happens when you're not fishing or playing golf. Daniels went for a late morning walk, and later Herb Jackson went for a run. A UPS truck delivers some boxes up and down the street, and eventually the mailman delivers the mail. It's funny, but no one seems to see me sitting by the window. I'm working and looking out the window when I see Herb walk up to the Perkins' front door and walk inside. Strange. Jim Perkins was away on business this week, I continue to watch and try to work, and it's only an hour later that he comes out the back door, walks down the driveway, and heads to his house. I tell myself that I'm letting my imagination take over, but at the same time I'm starting to think that I might be living in my own Peyton place. Is all this really happening when I go to work every day, and what exactly do I see? 
there has to be an acceptable explanation, so I try to shrug it off and get back to work. By the time evening comes, I've exercised three times, taken pills every three hours to keep the pain at bay, as they say, and finished off the last of my Jenny's corn chowder and ham biscuits. Chris is home, and I didn't see Jenny until her usual time, so I'm trying to get rid of the flooding thoughts again. Wednesday morning arrives and Nurse Payne soon arrives. Before she arrived, I had enough time to make myself a light breakfast to calm those two pills in my stomach and drink some coffee as an advance payment for what I had in front of me. She was especially strict with me that day, but claims that my knee is returning to normal and that she expects full mobility. I remind her that I've never been that flexible, but she just ignores me. I offer her a cup of coffee before leaving, but she says, I tried your coffee. You can use it to leave stains on furniture. I'm trying to say that there was a time when some furniture manufacturers did just that, but she just shakes her head and says, see you Friday, exercise and apply ice. Nurse. The pain went away, and I sat with an ice pack on my knee and drank the rest of my cold coffee. After this, everything is repeated as on the previous day. Dan is working in his garden that day, the Daniels are taking their morning walk, and I see Herb Jackson visiting Sally Perkins again. I tell you, these are damned Sodom and Gomorrah. It's lunchtime, and I'm getting ready to make a sandwich when I see Jenny Carpenter pull into her garage. I sit down in the chair, and five minutes later a black BMW pulls up, and a suit enters through the front door. This time he's there for almost 90 minutes, and the whole time I'm thinking how stupid I'd look if I said something to Chris, and it turned out to be a big mistake. I tell myself I don't know her family. The suit could be her brother or cousin. He might even be Chris's brother. Don't know. The rest of Wednesday passes without incident. Chris didn't show up for a beer on Tuesday, but late Wednesday night I heard a knock on the door. Is the invitation for beer still valid? Certainly. Do me a favor and take two. I'm waiting for you in the living room. We spent a pleasant hour before Chris had to head home. All this time I watched him carefully and did not detect a note of discontent or absent-mindedness. If something happens, he is not aware of it. I thought about asking him what he might know about BMWs or if he had any relatives who owned one, but decided I would never be able to do that. So I abandoned this idea. Thursday was a copy of Tuesday. I divided my time between exercise and knee treatment, then worked on my projects, took pills, and did it all over again. Life became boring and predictable. Meanwhile, Dan learned the fine art of car washing, the Daniels took a walk, and Herb visited Sally Perkins. This old fart has more work this week than I have in two years. I suppose I should explain this last point. You see, my wife Peg died two years ago. She was my lover and best friend. Her death was caused by being in the wrong place at the wrong time when a distracted city truck driver ran a red light. I was assured that she did not suffer, but I certainly did. I keep a photograph of her on the table next to my chair. Both of our children live their lives as they should, but sometimes it gets lonely. They offered to stay with me while I recovered, but I told them that I would be fine. After all, I have nurse pain to take care of me. When I told the kids that I was prepared to be stuck at home for a few weeks, and that I had a few cases of beer to tide me over. My daughter looked at her brother, and the next thing I knew, the refrigerator and freezer were full. But I was just joking. Friday arrived, and Maggie was punctual as always. I was ready for breakfast, pills, and coffee, so she didn't waste any time getting ready and got to work on me. You are progressing quickly, Henry. You must be fanatical about your exercise routine. If I'm progressing so damn fast... Damn, it hurts. Why do you keep working on me like a village prison guard? Do you have experience communicating with prison guards? I swear sometimes I don't know whether to laugh or curse at this woman. The last torture session ended, and she returned from the kitchen with an ice pack. I know that the weekend is approaching, but I want you to continue your exercises on both Saturday and Sunday. I took a deep breath and nodded. Then I'll see you on Monday, okay? Fine. There is no enthusiasm in your words, Henry. Are you becoming immune to my charms? Okay. That made me laugh a little, and I gave an answer that I later regretted. Have a good weekend, and I'll buy new locks for the door before Monday. She giggles. 
Next week, we will start working with the cane and try to get you off the walker. I like the sound of that. Agreed. This passed for a joke on Nurse Payne, and she left with him. Friday dragged on like every day. Dan was trimming the bushes in front of the house, the Daniels were walking, and Herb visited Sally Perkins. I was thinking about how life had become so terribly predictable when a black BMW pulled into the carpenter's driveway. I must not have noticed Jenny pull into her garage. I wondered if they had a regular schedule. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And how long did that last? I made myself a sandwich and helped myself to a beer, and then calmly watched as the suit drove away, followed ten minutes later by Jenny. Then a terrible melancholy fell upon me. I like these two, Jenny and Chris. They are caring and kind. They always seemed loving and attentive to each other. What I saw now seemed so terrible, out of keeping with her character. I searched my imagination for a plausible explanation and admitted that this was all speculation on my part, but it bothered me terribly. I did two things that weekend. I watched to see if the suit would visit them while Chris was home, and I started making plans. He never came and my plans quickly developed. I was very worried about what I had planned. If you asked me if I was sure that I was doing the right thing, I would answer, I don't know. What I did know was that if I approached Jenny with anything resembling an accusation, she would deny it. I would be called an abusive old man, and I would lose two friends. If I contact Chris, he will attack me, and again, I will be branded an abusive old man and lose two friends. And if I ignore it, it will be difficult for me to look Chris in the eyes and pretend to be his friend, hiding the painful truth from him. The only solution was to help him see for himself and hope I was wrong. Over the weekend, I made a list of my needs if I were to expand the store as planned. By that time, I was already thinking about tables and chairs. I need open space to move large pieces of wood to the machines as well as 240-volt electricity in several locations. I also need space for workbenches where I can work on manually fitting mortise and tenon joints, and then I need clear space for finishing. Overall, I need to at least double my current space. I sketched out a few ideas, playing with a few concepts, until I realized I also needed extra wood storage space because the tables needed large pieces of hardwood and the cabinets used a lot of high-quality plywood with quality veneer for the drawers. It all turned into a lot of work. I went to bed Sunday night with a heavy heart, knowing that the week ahead would most likely be painful for someone, but I also knew that someone could be me. Monday morning arrived, and with it, the arrival of Nurse Payne. I knew what to do, and by then I realized that we were making progress. If torture means I can go back to work, then let it be torture. She left me again sipping my coffee and balancing the ice pack on my knee. I tried to work, but my mind couldn't concentrate. Dan mowed the lawn again, and the Daniels went for a walk. Jim Perkins had returned from his travels, but still had an office in the city where he worked, so Herb visited Sally Perkins again. I couldn't help but wonder why anyone would stay in a marriage if they felt the need to cheat on their spouse. Is it money, security, or just a bad habit? Was this a game for them? Some despicable way to add a little excitement to their boring lives. They probably think they'll never get caught. I liked both Herb's wife and Sally's husband. They deserve better. It was midday, and I watched as Jenny pulled into her garage and lowered the door. Five minutes later, a black BMW pulled into the driveway, and I saw the suit re-enter the carpenter house as if he lived there. The decision was made, and I knew what to do. An hour later, the suit left. And after a while, Jenny left. It broke my heart. Monday and Tuesday passed without much incident. I tried to take care of business, answered random calls from the workshop, and watched the neighbors. It seemed like nothing had changed. On Wednesday morning, I watched Chris go to work. Maggie arrived and checked on me. And then I sat with ice and coffee and watched her drive away. It's time. I picked up my cell phone and called Chris. Chris Carpenter is listening. Chris, this is Henry Bennett. How are you? Okay, Henry, what do I owe? This phrase pierced me like a knife. If everything goes the way I expect, no one will enjoy it. I was wondering if I could tempt you with a sandwich and a beer for lunch. I heard him chuckle. Wow. 
It's hard to refuse such an offer. And since you'll be here, I'm thinking about expanding my workshop and would like to see what ideas you might have. Chris thought for a moment. Of course, I can come by your place this evening and we can work on your ideas. But now it's time for the big hype. Actually, my children are going to come to visit today, and I already have everything ready. I was hoping you could come today at, say, 11.30 or noon. I hated lying to him like that. Of course, why not? I could use a break from my routine. Okay, I'll come by lunchtime and we can talk about the new workshop. Great. See you. I felt like crap. There are a dozen ways this could go wrong, from Chris calling his wife Jenny and the suit not showing up today, her seeing Chris's car in my driveway and so on. I was sure that I could claim ignorance anyway, but wouldn't that make me a coward? Unfortunately for everyone, Jenny and the suit turned out to be just as predictable as the rest of my neighbors. Chris arrived around 11.45 and joined me in the front room. I laid out all my notes and drawings, and after Chris brought us each a beer from the fridge, we settled down with sandwiches, chips, and a cold glass. Then everything went according to plan. We sat down at a table near my front window and began going through the list of my needs as I saw them. I showed him a drawing of my current workshop and started showing him sketches of what I had in mind. At 12.05, Jenny pulled into her garage. Chris watched her for a while with a slightly confused but happy smile on his face. And then we resumed our conversation and were in a fairly productive stage of making plans when a black BMW pulled into Chris's driveway at 12.10. Chris was talking and suddenly stopped when a suit came out of the car and walked through his front door again as if he lived there. I silently watched my friend and waited. He tried to return to the drawings, but to no avail. I guess about ten minutes passed as Chris tried to talk, studied the plans, but went back to watching his house until my friend said, Excuse me. Without another word, he stood up, walked out the front door, and crossed the street to his house. It was strange, but I could swear that this time I watched a man walk through his own front door, as if he no longer lived there, and wondered how long he would be my neighbor. My window was open, and a few moments later I heard a commotion. There were shouts and exclamations, and it seemed like furniture was being thrown. I heard the sound of breaking glass and loud impacts of chairs against the wall. Shortly after, a scantily clad suit ran out the front door, jumped into the car, and sped off. After this, there was silence. Time passed, and just as I was starting to worry that Chris might have hurt his wife, he walked out of his house the same way he entered it and walked back across the street to my house. He just plopped down on my couch with that thousand miles look I've heard about and didn't say anything. I decided that my task was to wait until he was ready to speak, and at the right moment he said, This bitch had sex with him in our bed. Can you believe it? It's Jenny, of all people. I stood up and handed him the rest of the beer and said, Here, have a drink and I'll get you some refills. He drank it in one gulp. Thinking he needed to talk, I asked, You saw them? He just nodded. Are you sure that all this is by mutual consent? He spoke as if he were in a daze. I heard her. She was a voluntary participant. Despite all my observations and plans, I did not know what to do next. So I brought Chris a second beer and sat back down to be the engaged listener I assumed he needed. Finally, he began. A husband should never expect what I saw. My wife was naked with this idiot. She made all the same sounds as with me, only louder. She enjoyed it. Then Chris looked at me and said, I saw him when he got off her. There's nothing special about it. This was meant to be a leisurely discussion, and I needed to let my friend talk as much as he wanted. When he was silent long enough, I said, I heard a lot of noise, as if glass was breaking and furniture was being thrown. You haven't done anything that you regret, have you? No. Then, after a pause, he said, no, except for marrying this cheater. At this time, I saw Jenny's car slowly backing out onto the road. She seemed to hesitate for a while and then left. I think I just saw Jenny drive away. Yes, I told her to get her cheating ass out of the house. Chris's hands were shaking and his complexion looked like death. 
I knew that the next phrase would sound bad, but it had to be said. You need time to come to terms with what just happened. It may not be the end of the world. I'm not saying it will be easy. But I know that the girl loves you. Maybe you can make the relationship work when you have some time to think about it. The look he gave me was not reassuring. That's when I made my big mistake. Thinking that misfortune loves company, I blurted out, You are not alone. Herb Jackson visits Sally Perkins' house every day while her husband is at work. Chris just shook his head in disgust and muttered something under his breath. Then he turned to me. You knew, didn't you? Is that why you asked me to come today? What's the matter? Does this asshole really show up every day like clockwork? I tried not to interfere, but you can't refuse Chris. Well, with great reluctance, I replied, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, as far as I can tell. For how long? Chris's rage grew. Last week, and now this week. I don't know how long this has been going on. For a while, I stopped worrying about Jenny and started worrying about myself. Chris showed signs of being beaten and there was anger in his eyes. I remember thinking, this is what happens when a wife cheats on her husband. She strips him of his pride, and then his anger takes over. For a moment, Chris's anger seemed to dissipate as my friend buried his face in his hands and began to sob. At that moment, I was overcome with regret, and again I wondered if I should have just closed my eyes and let things happen as they were meant to, but these idiots were parking their car right in front of the house where all the neighbors could see it. What did they expect? At least Herb is trying to be a little standoffish, although I don't respect him for it anymore. After that, there was a long and mostly quiet hour as Chris drank his second and eventually third beer. I tried to find a way to reassure him that his action was justified while reminding him that she loved him, even if it didn't seem that way right now. I don't know how successful this was. Using his cell phone, Chris informed the office that he would be out today and eventually went home after I invited him to stay as long as he wanted. He just shook his head and said, Sooner or later I will have to face this, and it's better if it happens sooner. He left his car in my driveway and returned home to a broken man. An hour later he returned and I poured him another beer. He said, I cleaned up almost all the mess. Perhaps there are still shards of the broken mirror in the carpet. When I asked how the mirror got broken, he smiled. The son of a bitch ducked down. The chair missed him and hit the mirror. In a stupid attempt to support him, I said, I was surprised that he was able to leave on his own. Yes, I'm sorry about that. So that's good. You don't want to end up in jail because of this asshole. He just shrugged and shook his head as if he didn't know. We sat and drank until the evening. I reheated some leftover roast in a failed attempt to sober up, and Jenny never came home that night. Then, long after dark, Chris made the lonely journey to his home. Chris's car was still in my driveway Thursday morning, so I called him at home after the allotted time, hoping he might be up and sober. He didn't answer the first time, but called back half an hour later. He was in the shower when I called. I asked him, Would you like to have breakfast? I can cook, or you can take us somewhere. Why don't I go? Are you able to drive? He just laughed sadly and said, Yes, I can drive a car. I'll be there in ten minutes. He kept his word and was at my door ten minutes later. We stopped at a diner in town where I decided my job was to just listen if he wanted to talk. There were other people around us, so we were quiet. Jenny called late the night before, trying to apologize. She spoke through tears, and to Chris's credit, he kept himself under control. He wasn't ready to meet her, so she said that when he was ready, she would be at her sister's house. After that, I heard little about their confrontation. Chris would come over once or twice a week and we would drink a few beers while he asked vague and mostly introspective questions about marriage. I got the clear impression that things were not going well. This impression was confirmed when a for sale sign appeared in the yard of the house. He said they were getting a divorce and that he was grateful that they didn't have children yet. The most telling thing he said about this was that in therapy, Jenny admitted that she was very good at separating her life and that her lover had nothing to do with their marriage. Chris just shook his head and muttered, You damn are. And that was the end of our conversation. He learned that the affair had gone on longer than he could forgive.
It was sad to see their marriage fall apart, and I asked myself many times if I should have just turned a blind eye to it in hopes that Jenny would wise up and Chris would never find out. Inevitably, I asked myself how I would feel if I were Chris, and each time I decided that I would hate the friend who kept this secret from me. Jenny and Chris divorced and went their separate ways. It was years before Chris confided in another woman, but when he did, it seemed like a good choice. He met a widow his own age with small children, and she knew what loyalty was. Chris always wanted children and took to fatherhood like a duck takes to water. We remained friends, and he built an extension to my workshop. As for me, I never married again. I already told you that my wife died two years before the knee surgery. She was everything I ever wanted in a partner, and I miss her to this day. I decided that being alone was my limit, and I no longer tempt fate. However, I have several friends who don't have any complaints against me, can't get pregnant no matter how hard we try, and still like to sleep with a man from time to time. Yes, menopause is our friend. I have a good job, great kids, and company when I want it. Life is good. However, life is not so good for Herbert Jackson alone. It all happened about two weeks after Chris discovered his wife with that suit. I was sitting at my window. By that time, I was already able to get around quite well with the help of a cane and divided my time between the office and home. I wasn't ready to work in the workshop yet, but I was gradually getting there. I was reviewing plans for a kitchen remodel and putting together an estimate when I heard the familiar sound of glass breaking and furniture hitting the wall. I looked at the Perkins house and saw a naked Herb Jackson running out the front door and running down the street with his pants in his hands, followed by Jim Perkins swinging a baseball bat. I told myself another one caught. Jim seemed very motivated, and I estimated Herb's chances of making it home were no better than 50-50. I never found out who tipped off Jim Perkins, but I suspect it might have been a very angry carpenter who lived nearby. A week after that, I finally returned to the workshop, worked late, and thanked Providence that I no longer sat at my window and watched the lives of my neighbors in my own Peyton place. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.